I tried to fight cancer by loving life. I'd lost all of my money in retirement to medical bills. I'd lost my wife. I'd given up my practice. I was renting in a duplex for the first time in 30 years. I just lost everything. But even then, I found there were a lot of things if I concentrated on what I could love about my life, there were things every day that I could love. I could love the fact that I still had a daughter. I, I could love the fact that I was back in Oregon for the first time in 30 years. There were a lot of things I could still love. So I'm going to take every chance I get, and I don't know how much longer I have, but I'm gonna take every chance I get to be alive. I want to start off and I want to kick this off with just a super important thing that I think will bring us all the way in, but it'll give our listeners some context. You beat cancer twice and you have come to a realization that there's a couple of things that you did that impacted that on a significant basis. What changed in your life and what are you doing today and then that continues to move you in the right direction and away from the wrong direction? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, you always hear about you got to have a why. And for me, the why was love. Uh, I, I absolutely would not be here today if it wasn't for my daughter, who I just absolutely adore. And I was dying, Scott, in 2013 of leukemia and lymphoma. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm 6'1". Uh, I like to say six, one and a half. It's a guy thing. Um, I, I and understand. I, I weighed 210. Uh, at that time, I weighed 152 pounds. The biggest thing on me were my lymph nodes under my jawline. And then what my oncologist lovingly called my hockey puck. It was the size and shape of my uh, hockey puck under my right armpit. And I, I was ready to be done. I just lost my wife uh, from brain cancer. And then I realized, man, if I let this thing go and I let myself be done, then my daughter's an orphan. Uh, I don't know if you can be an orphan at 21 years old, but she seemed like a kid to me. And I, I felt like I needed to do everything in my power to stay alive for her. And so that was that was my big why. But then also... As a therapist, I'd help many people come back to life from persistent depression and anxiety and addiction by following Viktor Frankl's work, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And, and I found that, as he did, that if you have a passionate purpose, and it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else, you just have to really be passionate about it yourself. And so I started praying and meditating and asking for a purpose. And I'd written books, I'd had a speaking career, I'd been a teacher, I'd been a therapist. None of that could get me too excited anymore. I was grieving so heavily. And then I ran across a journal I'd been forced to keep in sixth grade, because if you'd have met the sixth grade boy I was, there was no way I was keeping a diary, you know? And uh, I thought, well, let's see what the 11 year old Dean had to say. And it said, when I get old, I got to climb Mount Everest, swim the English Channel. And as I said it, and it happens every time I talk about it, I got goosebumps. A shot of adrenaline just went through me. And I'm like, yeah, I got to do that. And real quickly, I started thinking, OK, um, my blood count and my immune system probably couldn't handle elevation, but I could swim the channel. And so that got me passionate. And that's one of the things that I think is absolutely most important in recovering from anything, persistent grief, trauma, cancer. The problem, Scott, with most folks when they're fighting cancer, their purpose and their passion is fighting cancer. And whatever we focus on grows. And I believe when you fight anything, it creates cortisol and <clears throat> cortisol and adrenaline rushes. And, uh, you know, I've sadly um, been in a lot of fights when I was a kid. Uh, I, I was raised in that generation where you duke it out, you know. 
And uh, cancer is not a fair fight, man. You, you fight cancer, you're probably going to lose every time. So the thing that I tried to do and continue to do to kind of wrap up my answer to your question is I tried to fight cancer by loving life. Warts and all, man, I, I'd lost all of my money in retirement to medical bills. I'd lost my wife. I'd given up my practice. I was renting in a duplex for the first time in 30 years. It felt like I had just lost every, lost my health, uh, didn't have good looks, but if I would have had, I'd have lost them too. Uh, so I just lost everything. But even then, I found there were a lot of things, if I concentrated on what I could love about my life, there were things every day that I could love. I could love the fact that I still had a daughter and she didn't think I was a total idiot, even though I'd made a lot of mistakes. I, I could love the fact that I was back in Oregon for the first time in 30 years. And anytime I wanted to, I could go to a host of rivers or mountains or lakes uh, you know, I, there were a lot of things I could still love. So, uh, to answer your question, it was, and this is how I still try to live loving everything as the big purpose and the motivation, having a mission or purpose that's bigger than myself and something that it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else, but gets me excited. And then uh, simply um, just trying to do my best to go through every day, uh, being the best that I can be by sharing that love and that purpose. Yeah, that's it's great. And I started there for a reason, because okay. there's a lot of interesting things about your story, um, you know. I'll look at the similarities. He has the believe mug he's drinking out of. And behind me <laughs> is the Ted Lasso believe thing. I'm a huge soccer fan. My boys both play. I played, you know, my whole life, whether it was uh, competitively, really? only competitively up through high school, but then it after college, just men's league, fun, competitive men's league for 20 years or more. And both my boys uh, wow. play incessantly. So, uh, you know, I love the sport. So obviously you also played soccer, I believe, correct? Yeah, Growing up? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I wanted to be, uh, all my life, both of my parents were mountain climbers, believe it or not. Even my mom, uh, cute little Swede, stronger than any of us, uh, was mixing it up with the guys climbing vertically back in the fifties when women were supposed to stay at home and wear pearls. Uh, and so, I always wanted to be a sponsored adventurer until I found soccer. And then I just became crazy about it. And I saw an old guy with the t-shirt not long ago that kind of sums up my soccer career. The older I get, the better I was. Yeah. Um, but I, I had kind of a lot of success. I was on the first Nike sponsored team. I was on the junior Timbers and they took us over to uh, England and we got to play under Birmingham. Wolverhampton, Liverpool, and Manchester United uh, under their reserve teams, Scott. And we thought we were so good. Yeah. And these reserve guys made us look like Bobo the Dancing Bear. Uh, so, it, you know, it I got a to different travel age. a lot over the world. Different yeah, time, but, different age, right? Exactly, exactly. But my fun part with my connection with Ted Lasso is I went to college to play soccer in Wichita, Kansas. So I got his Kansas experience and his Premier League experience. And I, I was about as clueless as he was when I went over to England. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. You know, that I, I what's interesting is the correlation and why I brought it back to that is a huge reason that you believe that you beat cancer, right? Your wife passed away. Um, right. And, and she passed away from a brain tumor and cancer. Right. And she, and it right. was, and it was horrible because you had already beat cancer once. You you right. now decided to do all the things that you knew were bad for you. You went into essentially a depressed state. You're a therapist. You know what's going on in 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 your own body, but you're doing it anyway because you are heartbroken. Right. And you are diagnosed again. You decide to to 
take control in a positive manner. But the correlation to Ted Lasso, the correlation goes beyond Kansas and beyond Premier League. <clears throat> Excuse me. It really goes into optimism and opportunity. And when right. presented with challenges, everything that that show was, when someone asked me about that show, you know what I tell them? If there was ever a show that everything you wanted to happen happened, this is the show for you. It was yeah. the right environment, the right messaging, the right humans, like just a great storyline. But it was all based on highly positive, optimistic mindset, gratitude, focusing on what you could and couldn't control. You know, it goes right, right back to Viktor Frankl. You know, you have that that tiny response time where you get to choose whether or not you, how you receive that information. Well, wow, Scott, you're you're bald. I can decide to say, wow, is he joking on me? He's really making fun of me. What's what's wrong? Or I could say, yes, I am. Thank you. Right. <laughs> I have that choice. But how we receive that information is really big. And you also I'm going to add one more part and then I'm going to let you run because sure, we, sure. we we share that ADHD thing together. So I know we could both go. <laughs> we do, don't we? <laughs> so so you're um, you know, the other the other point that I think is important is you also believe that cancer has kind of these external and internal um, indicators or things that can pop up inside of you. And I relate highly, I, I knock on wood, thank God I have not battled cancer, but I've had autoimmune and inflammatory issues many, many times in my life. And the way that I respond to stress is inside, meaning right. that it's not external. Here in my brain, I feel fine, but the right. body is screaming from the from the inside out. And this is extremely important because you witnessed this. So I correlate to Ted Lasso. I bring it back to optimism and pessimism, but I really would like you to speak just briefly on some of the tools and the mindset that you've really adapted that have helped you not only in the cancer fight, but in everything you're doing. Right. Yeah. I think it's really concentrating on as silly and as cliche as it sounds uh, people just don't do it. It's one of the hardest disciplines to follow, and that is staying in the moment. Uh, I One of the things that just shocked me is when I was just tormented by grief is if I, I called it striking myself stupid. If I forgot about the past and pretended I'd never had any past, and pretended I never had a future, that today I was almost an alien dropped on the earth to experience what it's like to be human. I found that magically, mysteriously even, I was fine. In this moment, no matter what's going on, I'm fine. And most of us are, unless something critical is happening. Uh, because the torment, all of my grief came from missing my wife and all the memories I had from the past and the fear of what it would be like to live without her in the future. But today I'm fine. Today I'm fine. So I always concentrate on what I call micro moments. Uh, right now, I get to be here with you. I didn't know that I was going to get to be here with you even days ago. Right. But all of a sudden, I'm meeting a guy that, man, I got a ton in common with, and I'm having a great conversation. I'm going to juice on that for days. And uh, that wouldn't have come if I'd have gotten way too far ahead of myself or way too far behind myself. And most of us are. And the problem with this modern digital age is we are just so stuck to our digital devices, we are training our brain to never be in our body at any given time. And so most of us are what I call walking zombies. We're, we're just sleepwalking through life. And I have been given this chance to actually be in my body, feel the good, the bad, and the ugly, and enjoy all of it. And so I'm going to take every chance I get, and I don't know how much longer I have, but I'm going to take every chance I get to be alive. And that is huge. Uh, so what I try to do is just every day treat it like a one-off. 
a lot of my friends think it's morbid, but I mean, today, here we are. What is it? The 28th. I pretend this is the last September 28th I'm ever going to get. How do I want to spend it? How is it different from other September 28ths? How can I make it the best September 28th I've ever had? And they're like, geez, Dean, that's so morbid. And I'm like, no, it, maybe it would be for you. But for me, it keeps it fresh. And I don't get lazy. The other thing I do, Scott, is every night before I go to bed, I zero out. I wipe that heart and mind clean. I imagine I go through my day. I notice what emotions I've felt that have been negative, hard, stressful. I let myself feel it and I let it go. I either forgive myself for being a total idiot or I forgive others for being less than perfect. Anything I've experienced, I feel it and I let it release. I breathe it out. Uh, my faith base is I give it to God. Say, you know, I, I pretty much screwed it up, did my best. You take this or, oh my gosh, I, I think they're a horrible person, but you made them. So I give it back to you. And how much <laughs> freedom and how, how much freedom does that? I mean, it, it's so interesting. There's two parts I want to hit on here because I believe that that is the freedom that most people are lacking. Like we actually think the more you think you can control everything, the more out of control your life actually is. And so every night oh. when you wipe it clean and you say, hey, God, I had a great day. Thank you for all the things that happened today. And here's some of the challenges, but I leave them with you. That's what you just said. That is, yeah. it's freedom. There's a freedom there. And I think the other thing is when you, when you, when you be where your feet are and you actually right. focus on just the moments that you're in, we are usually good, but it's the times that we're thinking too much into the future or we're thinking too much into the past that we right. get lost in all right. of that mess. If we think too far in the past, we stay in a depressed state, right? If we think too far in the future, we're in an anxious state. So right. the, crea the creative space is really where we are right now. And you're right, you know, not knowing that we're going to have this conversation, but then getting to have it creates opportunity for new people, new conversations, new thought patterns. And, you know, that freedom that you have when you lay your head down to rest provides better sleep. I know that's something else you changed dramatically, right? You actually didn't sleep much early in your, your life. No, if they would have had ADHD when I was a kid, I'd have been heavily medicated. <laughs> and so I, I worked two jobs because my parents made quite a bit of money and they were afraid. They were, I think their biggest fear was that I'd become a spoiled rich kid. And so they put me out in the berry fields of Oregon with the migrant workers starting at age eight. And uh, they came into uh, the living room when I was like 14 and says, uh, when are you going to get a job? I'm, like, I'm, I'm 14. I can't. Till I'm 16, they're like, no, look around. You should you should have some kind of job. And so I had two jobs from the time I was 15 to the time I was 42. And I just thought that's the way people were. And then also, I thought I was kind of superhuman. It was kind of an ego thing because give me four hours of sleep. I'm fine. I uh, used to drive my wife and my parents crazy uh, because I was always kind of wired. But as soon as I got diagnosed, I uh, I started forcing myself to have eight to nine hours of sleep a night. And it took a while for me to settle my heart and mind down. You know, going back to that zeroing out, um, we carry so much from one day into the next. You know, we hear the phrase start the day fresh, but there's no way to do it. And we, we brush our teeth so our mouths and our teeth don't rot, but we never brush our hearts and minds and then wonder why our hearts and minds are rotting. Uh, we've, we've got to start, I think in 10 years, Scott, people will, everybody will be doing zeroing out just as a matter of self-care and, and a matter of course, because it makes neurological sense. Uh, the latest in dream theory is the reason we dream is it's our unconscious trying to resolve the most intense emotion we had that day. And whatever we focus on grows. And so 
if we take junk into sleep, our unconscious is just going to chew on it and grow it. And we're going to wake up feeling worse. And so it's really, I can't stress enough. I think it was one of the pivotal pillars of my cancer recovery, learning how to just get down to zero before I go to sleep. And I wake up annoyingly. This is what I've heard from family and friends. I wake up annoyingly happy, <laughs> which I never did before. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting though, because you are, you, you've adjusted your lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> A lot of the very things that your dad and your mom instilled in you are, are the things that it requires to survive when times get tough, right? Sure. Like the challenge is you're, you, you were climbing mountains at nine years old while your friends right. were watching, you know, stupid television Scooby shows, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All weekend long while you're yeah. climbing a mountain at, at, at nine years old, the, the tallest in Oregon. Right. And, right. and so your parents were pretty pivotal, like pivotal at giving you this foundation Talk just a little bit about how important that's been in your life. And then maybe understanding, because there's a second part to this, the The first part is how pivotal and important it is foundationally. But one of the things that I'm always intrigued in is when you learn how to use it correctly for yourself, meaning that if you only take what they were doing, which was giving you this hardship and this challenge and this focus and this drive you eventually end up like you probably were. And like I've been many times in my life, especially early on, way too busy, way too distracted, way yeah. not focused on my feet and where they were. You right. know, and if I did have a break, I felt like I had to do 27 more things. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so the good things are I learned how to do it. The bad things were I had to learn how to manage it. And so I'm interested how you did that. Yeah. I, I wish I could have said it was just by um, smarts and just good sense, but I learned that lesson through life's trials. Uh, first, losing my wife uh, 15 days before our 30th anniversary. I mean, I grew up with her. I, I used to joke that uh, I went through, I was still going through puberty for the first three years we but then people started making that a weird thing. And so I quit joking about that. But uh, I, I just grew up with her. And once she was gone, she had been such a huge part of my life that it I saw firsthand how short life is and how precious it is, precious it is and how fragile we, I mean, because she showed none of the typical signs of a brain tumor. All of a sudden, her, the right side of her face fell. We took her in two days later, got a brain scan. 52 days later, she was dead. I mean, it was just boom. And she was the healthiest person I've ever known and came from a long line of really healthy people. She'd always worked out, always eaten well, always stayed trim. She was so Baptist that by the time she died, I realized she'd never in her life smoked a cigarette, taken drugs, or even had a sip of beer. I'm like, that's really, really Baptist, Scott. And, and so it made no sense that she of all people would get sick and die. And so if it can happen to her, it can happen to anyone. And so it's, I, I just found that it was really important to not take anything for granted. I, I've kind of lost track of what the question was. I, it doesn't matter because the point is you've, you've gotten around to the, to the importance of life being fragile. And the other right. thing that you said in the, in the last question, in the last conversation was you mentioned that, um, you know, you live each day like it could be the last September 28th or whatever date it is. Right. right? I right. find that right. extremely interesting. I, I follow you know, father Mike Schmitz um, on, on the hallow app. And I listen to a lot of the stuff that they put out. And it's really interesting to me because he talks about living life with eulogy virtues. And, you know, when you are gone, when you say and tell someone else and share someone's life with a room full of people that are celebrating the passing of someone you talk about the things we talk about on the show all the time, love, impact, faith, energy, 
how they loved, who they loved. Love is a key component, right? right? But if right. if we're if we actually understand that it's not infinite that we're here, but it's finite, it's a a reduced amount of time. The more you acknowledge those things, the more you focus on the things that matter most. And I think right. that's what you're really you're saying. I just I kind of had this aha moment that a lot of the things I had focused on, you and your wife had you had you had saved money. You were finally oh, yeah. starting to get ahead. You were you right. were in the right chapter of your life. Your your daughter was young, you know, but but at the point where you finally start to feel like you're swimming above water with your career right. and everything else. Right. And it's all everything, gone. all the fruits were starting to come. All those years of hard work and paying our dues and being responsible, we were just starting to really reap the benefits of that. And we were talking about uh, retiring and just letting me speak and write in three years. And we had a lot of plans to travel and it, it was looking good. And like that, it was all gone, all gone. Um, but I think the question was, how did I take what my parents gave me and use it and, and kind of transform it a bit? And uh, grief taught me how to transform what was uh, natural, fairly learned, uh, and um, consistently disciplined resilience. You know, starting at age eight, uh, I mean, I'd always hiked and, and did things with them uh, ever since I can remember. Um, but we started, they started allowing me, I was kind of disappointed because I didn't get to start actually climbing mountains till I was eight. And I'm like, what's the deal? <laughs> you know, at five, I remember taking my parents aside. I'm like, I'm five, I'm ready. <laughs> and they're like, no, you know. Um, but anyway, I remember uh, at nine when I was climbing Mount Hood, uh, we started at 10 o'clock and climbed all through the night. And by about two o'clock, I was knackered. And my dad said, you tired? I says, yeah. He's like, good. Uh, helps you know you're alive, push through it. And I'm like, I'm nine, dad. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that but you did. Uh, I, but you, you did I push learned it. from them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had no other choice, really. And my mom was pushing through it. And I guess this was an innate 1960s chauvinism, but I didn't want my mom to outshine me, you know? Um, if mom can do it, I sure better be able to. Um, but anyway. I don't think that's gone away. I don't think that's gone away. I don't think anybody, any guy wants to admit that he wants his mom to beat him in something athletic, or if you are, you're lying to yourself or you set right. those standards for yourself. So, right. um, I love my mom, but if my mom beats yeah. me in a race, I have a problem. I got to figure that out quick. Right. So, well, and if you met my mom, she's quiet, super sweet, tiny little five, two Swede. But oh my gosh, Powerful. if you see her climb, she was tougher than nails. So uh, anyway, um, they taught me those things, but those things then came in really handy. And resilience plus love creates something that's extremely strong. Um, if you use, if you take anything, it doesn't have to be resilience. But if you take anything and infuse it with love and joy, you've got something that's almost uh, impossible to break. And, you know, so many times, one of the most frequent questions I get, Scott, is, hey, Dean, you were still an active cancer patient. How did you swim 187 miles in 40 degree water? Took you 22 days. And I tell everybody, <clears throat> after what I'd been through the three years previous, it never occurred to me. Uh, I just was always staying in that day. I wasn't thinking about the hundreds of miles I had to do. I was just thinking we, we had every day as a stage. We'd look at that, and then we'd break it down into hour increments. And then I would just start swimming and look forward to my break at the end of the hour. So we broke it down and stayed like I was talking about in that moment. But then also, I was just thinking, man, 
I'm in Oregon. I'm with my folks. I'm with some friends. I'm in this beautiful river. I'm strong enough to be here. I'm not in the hospital. I'm not at a funeral. So life is good. And I think if I hadn't been through my cancer journey and been so sick and felt what it felt like to have no energy and be powerless, that it would have been really hard to do this extreme marathon. But it really wasn't, comparatively speaking. Yeah, what's interesting is there's a couple of cool things that I think you hear about when it comes to treating yourself or thinking about your own body when it comes to something as bad as cancer. You were out in nature, number one. So you were you were breathing and living and a part of the water. You were in cold water, which cold therapy we know helps to reduce inflammation. You spent 22 days at 40 to 50 degree temperatures consistently uh, uncomfortable, but also healing the body. Mentally, yeah. you were focused on and a I goal. And I didn't know that. Right. Mm -hmm. and. Mentally, you were focused on a goal that right. were shortened and 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 broken down into parts where you could actually feel accomplished at the end of every day. There was no right. benefit in looking back. There was no benefit in looking too far forward. Right. And then you practice gratitude every single day. That's that's the recipe you just went through. And if you look at that, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, he also did not take any chemo, I, I believe, correct? There was no chemo, no radiation. You finished this 22 days later and you were in radical remission. The same doctor who was a friend of yours, who knew your body, who who had looked at you months earlier like you were going to die and like he had no solution. You went back to him and he said, if I didn't diagnose the cancer myself, I wouldn't even have known it existed. Yeah, he said that. And then also uh, University of California, San Diego, the world's number three researcher, and the type of leukemia I had said that. He's like, Dean, you know, I know you've got this friend, but I am an expert in this. And if I hadn't diagnosed you a year ago, I, he said in 30 years, I've never seen chronic lymphocytic leukemia go away. And in the medical journals, it says it never does. Somehow mine did. Well, I think uh, it's funny. I, I was diagnosed with colitis and it eventually became Crohn's. It was autoimmune. My oh, gastro wow. doctor and I are friends and um, I've been in remission for a number of years. And it's Ew. it's something that is internal. And what what he always says, you're you're a miracle. And I laugh. I'm like, I'm not a miracle. I just took responsibility for my own issues that were causing the inflammation and the problems. There's external causes things that i can't control the way i'm right. wired for example this is this is in my it's in my genetic breakdown from the sicilian roots to both grandparents like it was it was something that everybody dealt with but not everybody figured out how to turn it up or down as they needed to and again i'm I, as i turn it over you know to faith in something bigger than myself that's the first thing i can't control it but the second thing was you know i start every day slow I get in the sauna. I do a cold plunge every day. These are things literally every day that I'm home and active by my stuff. I work out. I take walks. These are things that I wasn't prioritizing prior. So grief taught you how to take the resilience your father and mother had taught you and actually apply it to something much bigger, which was right. really how to live your life the appropriate way and not get too tilted in one direction. And we have a shortened timeline today. So I'm trying to speed up with some of the cool things that I think are worth talking about. But sure, sure. but two things that I think are good for the audience to know is number one, you went out to Kansas to play soccer and you and you went to a small Christian school where you met your wife and right. you were married. And she basically told you that she's never leaving Kansas and you moved out there and you stayed. And it wasn't until she passed that you found yourself back with your family and in Oregon. And that was, I think that's just nice context to the to the storyline because it shows you that your whole identity had changed and shifted and you adjusted for love and for your 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 spouse and your daughter. And it was it was who you were. And when that was right. taken away, it's only natural to grieve. You also were a licensed therapist working with a lot of trauma victims and many women 
that that were uh, sexually abused or had traumatic issues for many, many years. And that negativity and those stories and that challenge is something that that really was eating at you. And these are all right. things that you looked back and saw as just really, really big challenges that maybe were causing even more of the internal struggle. And so when you shook that out, you finally started to do things that you had always done. And I love this last part. And this is, you went back to being a boy. You found that journal. You started here. And I think it's cool to go back. This is the beauty. This is the beauty of ADHD. People that don't <laughs> have ADHD don't know how to go back and forth like this. And this is valuable. Yeah. Okay. So an exercise I did, I, I was, uh, I'm in the financial um, business. I had been a financial advisor for over 20 years, about 15 years into my career, maybe 12 years. I started to interview my clients and my best clients, the ones that I wanted to understand their story. And one of the questions I asked them was, is there anything in your life that you always dreamed of being or doing? And, oh. and you would see them light up. I mean, I was in a meeting one time and the wife said, I always wanted to be a ballerina. And the husband looked at her and was like, I didn't even know you liked ballet. And she's like, oh, I've dreamed of it my whole life. It's something she, she had an aha moment, much like you did when you got chills. He then said, well, if I didn't know you loved it, we can go to a ballet. I'll go to a ballet with you. And, and all of a sudden they had this connection and this, this rooted uh, innocence that when you start to dive deep into who you were before you decided to be what you thought you needed to be instead right. of who you actually are is very empowering. And these are the things that I think are just really cool to bring up as a part of your story. And, and, um, and so I'll let, I'll turn it over to you for a second, but I just thought those, those points and those comments were so valuable to listeners. Oh yeah. I think to back up on your question, I got absolutely fascinated with this idea that all of us come into this world uh, with a dream and a purpose. And so in 2005, in that small town in my private practice, 50 clients in a row in the first session, and you know, usually they come in and they're really having a tough time. And so you wouldn't expect for them to be able to tell you what their dream is. But I'd ask a similar question. I'm like, uh, what did you always want to accomplish or be? Uh, what, what were your hopes and dreams? And many at first, be like, I don't know. And I'm like, no, at one point you had hopes and dreams. What were they? My hypothesis is only about 13 to 15 would be, be able to tell me specifically what it was. It ended up being 48 out of 50. And many times they were so idiosyncratic and so specific. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then out of those 48, only two are what I call American BMW dreams. Um, I want a bigger house, a better car, more money. Almost always it was stuff like I had one guy that brought himself back to life. And this is what gave me the power to chase my dream and swim in the Willamette River, he wanted to become a wooden duck decoy carver. And when he said that, I almost had to chew my tongue in two not to laugh <laughs> and make fun of him. I'm like, well, let's pursue it. And he did over the course of the next year. And his depression went away. And he by the by the end of two years, he was making a thousand to three thousand dollars a duck. Um, it was just gorgeous stuff. But we all, I believe, we have an instinct inside of us like a goose to fly south in the winter. Uh, Scott to be Scott, Dean to be Dean, and they're never exactly the same. Um, I, I had a dream to swim the Willamette. It started in 1984. It didn't seem practical. And so I forgot about it. And after swimming and starting to get better training in the pool for a few months, all my blood counts are going in the right direction. I got out of the pool right around Christmas. And it was like, who cares if another middle-aged man puts on a Speedo and swims to France? It does the world no good. And in my case, it's not going to be a pretty picture. So I started praying and asking 
how could I do this thing? And going back to our very first part of the conversation, how can I make it bigger than me? And I thought, well, and that's, that's when the Willamette came back. And I found out still no one had. Uh, and I thought I could partner with the local Leukemia Lymphoma Society and try to raise money and awareness for them. But also, more importantly, try to inspire other cancer patients to refuse to give up simply because they've been diagnosed. Because if I, as an active cancer patient, and I'm no Olympian, I wish I was. I'm no great athlete. Again, I wish I would have been. Um, I, I've never been on a swim team, never won a swim race. Uh, so if I, of all people, can set a world record and do something no one in history has ever done, anybody can pretty much do anything if they follow their heart and they're passionate about their dream. Well, you, yeah. you're talking about purpose and whether it's carving right. wooden ducks, whether right. it's swim in the Willamette or, right. or it's just out there accomplishing whatever dream it is. A lot of people have this vision that they're supposed to find something that they're passionate about. But the key is it goes back to the word love. When you love something and it's in you, you don't have to find it. You'll find it by trying different things. You'll find it through challenges. You'll find it through grief. You'll find it through failure. Like, you know, the, it, it took that man to come see you to have right. a very, very challenging part of his life shared with you to have that question asked. And now he's making $3,000, $5,000 a month for the rest of his life on something that he yeah. always dreamed of doing. And right. these are simple things, but it's that it's that love word again, that right. it's passion and love are inside of you. I also like the fact that we're talking about something super cool, which is who you were before the world defined you, before you tried to figure out what people wanted you to be. Maybe you're still living your life the way you thought your parents wanted you to live or the way that that, uh, you know, you you always envisioned it to be. And the the 48 out of 50 people, the two or three that that said they cared about money and houses, it's the emptiest vision, the emptiest passion, the emptiest thing in the world, because pursuing that is is not a goal. Having it be a byproduct because you do something you love is how, you know, Lionel Messi becomes the greatest soccer player. He loves playing the sport. You can see it every time he's an artist on the field, right? He gets paid because he's the best, but he's the best because he loves it probably more than anybody else. Right, right. He's pretty talented yeah. too. Yeah, I was going to say, well, you got to have some talent as well. Yeah. And and the thing that I found out is there are, because I've worked with so many people on identifying that dream that really they can be passionate about. And there are, like you said, glimmers throughout their life, particularly childhood with the wedding duck decoy carveries. It's like, you know, anytime I got some time off work, he, had, he was a high level executive, real stressful job. He'd take a couple of weeks off every year. And he said, within a two days, I had a piece of wood in my hand and I was carving. And with me, uh, ever since I was a little kid, we'd do these multi-day backpacks in the Cascade and come across an alpine lake. And my parents would say, hey, Dean, but you can't swim across that. And I'd be like, yes, I can. It just occurred to me only two years ago, Scott, and I confronted my parents on this. I was so ADD. I hadn't shut up for hours on the trail. I thought they were doing it to help me feel like a stud and to applaud me because they'd always cheer when I'd get back. No, they knew if I had my head down in the water, they'd get a few moments of silence. And I'm like, is that what you guys were doing? And they didn't they didn't confirm or deny, but they chuckled quite a bit. So. They were tiring you out. I mean, the thing you have to do with ADHD or any level of, of energy with kids is right. sometimes you have to give them a task. Right. And it's and it's going to wear them out and it's going to calm them down. And just that alone allows us to function. But we're not much different than that. Right. Sometimes right. we're so strung up on what we're getting done in the world. We're so caught up in the executive space that we live in that it's when you find that piece carving that wood or walking on the beach or swimming in a river that you are actually able to get back to who you are and what you feel and what you know you need in your life. Right. And I wish I could say I'd lived this way my whole life. But like I mentioned, 
in my 20s, I thought, okay, I got to get a bunch of degrees. So I started racking them up. And then being in my generation, you know, greed was good, like Michael Douglas said. And so I thought I needed to buy my wife the fanciest cars, the biggest house, nice clothes. And that was what I was trying to do for years and years and years. And like you said, it was, I mean, it might provide satisfaction for a couple days or to see her face light up for a couple hours, but it was empty, very empty. The purpose that kept you going was your daughter. How has your, how has your daughter, um, how have, have you together or has she individually, um, you know, been impacted in a positive way by these changes? Is there something that you've noticed or recognized in the way she lives her life or has, has functioned based on your challenges? I think so. I hope so. Uh, she was in her senior year, uh, October of her senior year is when her mama died. And I mean, that's a tough time anyway, but it was a serious blow to her. Uh, you know, I, I've just been so impressed by her. Her grade average, I probably would have dropped out of school, Scott. Her grade average didn't even drop. Um, and uh, then when she saw me go uh, through the Willamette, I did it. And I didn't tell anyone to prove to her that I was strong and going to live. She thought I was committing suicide. It scared her to death. I've since found that she became fairly suicidal during that swim because she thought she was losing me too. Oh. I'm glad I didn't know it at the time. Uh, it healed me so much. I wanted this for her. So I took her over to Ireland in 2017 and I had her be my guide boater uh, swimming a river. You, you know, you're doing the front crawl. You can see about 10 yards ahead and about a quarter of a mile but danger is always 30, 40 yards ahead. So you, you need somebody in front of you and then you just follow them and they, they pick your line and keep you safe and warn boaters and that sort of thing. So she was my guide boater for 180 miles in the River Shannon. And it was so much harder than the Willamette because there was no current. It was a series of open lakes and even what they call inland seas. Uh, and we got blown off several times. As a matter of fact, uh, 23 out of 25 days, we had a 10 mile or an hour or more headwind. And a lot of people don't know this, but when you get 10 to 15 miles of an hour of headwind, it pushes the first two feet of water back in the direction of the wind. So for 180 miles, it felt like I was swimming on a treadmill. I mean, but the Irish are amazing. I fell in love. They are with the amazing. Irish it's people. a beautiful oh. place. Oh, and they're just so generous and friendly and fun. And she got what I got in her own way. That river and the beauty and generosity of the Irish people really started her walk back into life. And so she decided to stay over in Dublin and got her graduate degree in creative writing. And she now lives on the beach. Uh, she, my um, dedication is spending time in nature, I think has influenced her. She walks the beach at least once a day, sometimes twice. It's been very therapeutic for her and it really helped her with the writing. I think she just finished her 23rd novel. Wow. And so she's just really disciplined and prolific. And she's the one that wrote my book and put my book together, The Wild Cure. Well, that that answered my question. It's it's impactful. And I can I can see the value and impact that you feel from that relationship. I also love how you took what your parents instilled in you and showed her how that resilience and that love and that challenge can yield a much better life in the in the long run. So um Dean, we're out of time today. So okay. uh, I want to make sure that everybody knows how to find you and to get your right. messaging and to hear your gratitude. And what, what are the, what's the best way to follow you or to find you? Well, I am most active on Instagram uh, at Dean Hall official. And as a, um, an act of discipline and gratitude, you DM me or make a comment and until I get thousands and, and even I've had a couple posts go viral and uh, had 
I don't know how many thousands of comments. I answer every. Uh, and so if you DM me, I am going to answer you whether you want me to or not. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. And if they want to have uh, you run, you run getaways. I in, do in the in nature to re mm -hmm. to, to reboot to do this exact right. thing. What just right. give a brief understanding of that and how do they find that? Is it on your site yeah. on the website? Uh, my website is called thewildcureway.com, and uh, they can find all of my offerings there. But one of the things I love to do is hear about their fitness level their comfort with the wilderness, their experience with the wilderness, and tailor make it to their desire and their needs. So all of them are very bespoke um, retreats and, and offerings. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure all the 30 years of therapy and good challenges <laughs> equip you to fully be a great listener. Um, I Dave, hope so. You're not only a great listener, you're a great guest and a great communicator. I'm grateful to have oh, you on the you, show. Scott. Thanks for joining our audience. And uh, we will look forward to talking to you again in the future, sir. I sure hope so, Scott. This is the most fun I've had in a long time. It's it's just such an honor to be your guest and get a chance to meet you and hopefully start a lifelong friendship. Sounds great to me. Have a great okay. one. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you liked it, there's more where this one came from. Click here and enjoy some more.